Today, I'm reacting to Sean Nalivanage's takes on lifting from an exercise scientist perspective. Welcome back, Dr. Mile Wolf here. Still a non-functional sign, but we'll get it fixed soon. Today, we're reacting to Sean Nalivanage. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm doing my best, apologies if I wish your name. But I have seen some of his stuff loading around. I know he's a true fitness OG. I remember seeing him at the same time as I was following Mike Chan. You hear me? So he's been around for a while, but I never actually interacted with his content very much. And so today I want to blind react to some of his shorts. Let's get into it. All right, that was short one on the Smith machine for hypertrophy. My honest reaction is pretty good, honestly. Like the Smith machine is a good tool for hypertrophy. And the two most recent meta-analyses we have comparing free weight movements, what most people think is king for muscle building and machine-based movements, finding they're both equally effective for muscle building. And so whether you use more machines, including the Smith machine or more free weights, all else being equal, it's not going to make or break your results. And the Smith machine can be cool for certain things, right? Like if you want to lengthen partials on the bench or lengthen partials on the squat and you want to be able to safely fail without a spotter or what have you, any number of things, it can be really cool for those applications. And so I think the Smith machine is awesome for muscle building, but there are certain movements that he's recommending here that I don't necessarily fuck with on the Smith machine. Specifically, in my experience, things like Romanian deadlifts and upright rows can be a little bit awkward on the Smith machine, because it can be a relatively heavy load and either you use straps to make your group more comfortable, but then unracking the weight becomes challenging and then sometimes it re-racks mid-set and it's awkward. I don't particularly like it for certain movements if you find that the Smith machine tends to re-rack or unrack itself awkwardly. And so for certain movements, I don't really like it, but on principle, I agree. Smith Machine gets a thumbs up. How much protein should you eat per day to maximize muscle growth? Well, the latest research analyzing 49 studies found that you really only need 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 175 pounds or 80 kilos, 130 grams of protein per day will max out your gains. And going beyond that has, quote, no further benefit on gains. If you want to build muscle at your full potential, one and a half to two grams of protein per pound of body weight is actually ideal. At least, that's what I remember reading as a teenager in Flex Magazine back when most people thought that more protein equaled more gains. In reality, the daily cap where growth will be maxed out is quite a bit smaller, which is a good thing because getting into that range should be pretty easy for you. And this is a key concept to understand about bodybuilding in general, which is that beyond a certain point, there's nothing you can do to force additional gains. Every variable in your program has a ceiling in place over any given time frame, whether it's total calories, protein, training volume, frequency, supplementation, or whatever else, and we're trying to push things further can actually be counterproductive. So the best thing you can do is hit your daily slash weekly targets for each one, stay patient, and let those small efforts slowly add up over time. That was yet another good take. I respect that take as well. I think that once you've ticked off the big rocks, namely like volume, calorie intake, sleep, stress, there's a lot of things where overdoing it won't necessarily benefit you further. With volume specifically, we don't quite know where that ceiling is yet. Out of eight studies comparing over 20 sets and under 20 sets per week per muscle, four have found more hypertrophy from over 20 sets. But seemingly, even those highest volume investigations of like 37 average weekly sets or 42 sets per muscle per week, those have also found more hypertrophy sometimes. So we don't quite know where that ceiling is yet. But for most variables, like protein especially, there is definitely a top end of how much is protein going to benefit you, past which point does additional protein no longer increase muscle growth. And that is correct, around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram per day is correct. Quick caveat that he couldn't possibly provide in a 60 second short, but that I'll provide anyways. If you're older, say above 65 years old, if you're plant-based, if you're currently cutting, you may benefit from a bit more protein up to around two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. Conversely, if you're higher in body fat, say above 25% as a man or 35% as a woman, you may need a bit less protein than the 1.6 gram rule would predict for you. That's because the rule is based on body weight, not on fat-free mass. So if you're higher in body fat, it will overestimate how much protein you need. If you're a naturally thin guy that wants to put on size and you're even asking this question, you're seriously in the wrong frame of mind and it legitimately is gonna kill your gains. Is a calorie surplus necessary to build muscle? Dude, if you weigh 150 pounds right now and you wanna to get to 180 pounds, 
how is that gonna happen without a calorie surplus? How are you gonna add 30 pounds of mass to your body or even 10 or even five pounds without consuming more energy than you expect. If you're truly serious about building muscle and you're even asking this question, whether it's because you're afraid to lose your abs or maybe you don't have a big appetite or whatever, then you probably need to pick up one of these or you're just gonna end up spinning your wheels in the long run. And make sure to check the pinned comment for a few more important points on this. Subscribe for more no BS fitness tips. Yeah, another W. I think this is pretty good advice. Ultimately, it's important to consider context and you can absolutely make gains in muscle size at maintenance or even at a deficit. But if you're currently like, as a man, eight to 12% body fat, and you've been lifting for like a year and you really want to gain muscle, you're gonna need to book. Like your body at some point probably won't be able to recomp meaningfully anymore. And around eight to 12% is the lowest I would ever go if you wanted to recomp. At that point, if you wanted to gain muscle, like actually put on a pre-show muscle, you wouldn't need to gain weight. So that is a W. But that's not to say you can't recomp if you're a little bit heavier or a bit higher in body fat. You can absolutely recomp. You can gain muscle. You can put on five, 10 pounds of muscle easily. So yeah, if you wanna build bigger shoulders, then doing lateral raises like this definitely will work. You might've seen this variation show up in your feet at some point, but there is one important tweak I'd recommend if you really wanna maximize the tension on the side dealt with this movement and not be limited by the need to stabilize the bar and prevent it from tilting back and forth. And that's to um, just use a dumbbell. I agree with everyone here. I agree that you could do lateral raises with a barbell and you would still grow your side delts. Ultimately, it's not all that different, but it is just slightly worse for no good reason. That is unless your gym is so busy that there's no dumbbells left, but you somehow have access to a barbell and then this makes sense. But yeah, almost always a dumbbell is going to be just slightly better so just use dumbbells. Here's the best body fat percentage every man should have. That body fat percentage is 12%. 12% is the perfect body fat percentage because you're lean enough to look good, but not too lean to where you look like a skeleton or it's just unsustainable. Your libido and appetite are stable and you just feel amazing. Without effort, you could be at 12% year round. In fact, if I could stay one body fat percentage the rest of my life, it would be 12%. Well, there's no one best body fat percentage for every person because it depends on your goals and preferences and what feels best for you. You know, there's technically nothing wrong with being in the mid to slightly higher teens as long as you're still staying within the healthy range. But for guys who are training with aesthetics as a primary goal, who wanna look both muscular and impressively lean, and who aren't genetic outliers who can sit at sub 10% body fat without side effects, then yeah, I would say around 12% give or take is gonna be the sweet spot in most cases. It's low enough to look great with your shirt off, but also high enough to still look good in clothes. Your appetite, energy, and libido will all be kept in check. And it's a level you can realistically maintain year round while still having a good amount of dietary freedom and not having to obsess over every calorie or revolve your whole life around your fitness plan. Yeah, another decent take. I think both people were correct here. I definitely think there's more individual variation around the optimal body fat percentage than both of them gave credit for here. Like some people just will not be able to maintain 12% body fat without having an insane amount of dietary restriction, social restriction, and just hunger and metabolic adaptations, quote unquote. But I think for a lot of men, depending on their circumstances, around 12 to 15% body fat can be sustainable. Equally, I also appreciate he didn't fear monger around 15 to 20% body fat as a male as being unhealthy, because the actual evidence we have around body fat percentage and how it relates to your health suggests that 15 to 20% body fat as a man is perfectly healthy. In fact, it's some of the healthiest body fat percentages you could be at. If you want to look lean, it's not the best body fat percentage, but that is not the question. And I also appreciate that he mentioned at 12%, you'll look very good with your shirt off, pretty lean, vascularity, abs, etc. But you'll also look okay in clothing. Because if you've ever competed in bodybuilding, you will have noticed that in clothing, you look malnourished. And it's not necessarily a good look. How do I get that capped shoulder look as a natural? Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be a downer here, but the reality is that you pretty much can't. Okay, what you have to keep in mind is that the delts are a muscle with really high levels of androgen receptors, and that's why some guys are able to achieve that round look to their shoulders, because they're taking a bunch of gear. I mean, this is actually the biggest telltale sign for steroid use there is. Just take one look at the delts and it's pretty much a dead giveaway. So if you're gonna stay natty, I would honestly just forget about it. Okay, no amount of compound presses and pulls and isolation work over a prolonged period is gonna make much of a difference. Either hop on cycle or just accept the fact that your shoulders will probably always be mediocre at best.
And if you actually believed any of that, make sure to give the pinned comment here a quick read through. Sean, I'm not going to read your pinned comments anymore. I've had enough. I, I don't like to read. But yeah, the video is spot on. Capped shoulders mean something. People view capped. Like, what does capped even mean? At what point do they become capped? You know, just train your delts and do your best to grow muscle. And you'll find out whether or not you can achieve it naturally. I couldn't tell you. No one else could tell you. But I think most people's definition of capped shoulders is achievable naturally. A big thing with deltoids looking big though is just getting lean enough. Like if I get lean enough, my rear delts will pop out from the side triceps and look nice. If I'm fat, they don't look great. So basically just lift, gain muscle, eat enough protein, sleep, get lean enough, and that is your best chance at ever getting capped delts short of taking steroids. If your main motivation for lifting is aesthetics, if it's for vanity purposes because you just want your physique to look a certain way, Yeah, that's fine. You can train for whatever reason you want. And if someone tries to tell you otherwise, just hit a juicy front lat spread while staring directly into their eyes until they get uncomfortable and walk away. I mean, it's definitely possible to go down an unhealthy path with that if you start pushing for extreme degrees of muscularity and leanness, but most people out there would be lying if they said that having bigger biceps and visible abs wasn't their initial motivation to go to the gym. Now, maybe in the long term, it is healthier to have other reasons for training beyond just your appearance alone, but even if that is your primary focus right now, at the end of the day, you're still working on it on a consistent basis, you're going to be physically stronger than the vast majority of the population, you're likely within a healthy body fat range, hopefully you've got some cardio in there, and you're probably following a decently healthy diet as well, and so if wanting to look good at the beach leads you to all those other things anyway, then it's just a win all around as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, another good take. What is going on? I was expecting to see worse takes, and yet I'm getting here good takes. Yeah, I agree. Whatever you want to train for, you can train for. Oh, you don't care about size, you just want to get strong? Train for that. You just care about size, you don't care about getting strong? Train for size. I do think at some point reflecting as a lifter and being like, alright, why am I still doing this is good because eventually it's like, okay, you've grown some muscle, you've gotten stronger, you've staved off the risk for sarcopenia and low bone density and osteoporosis and what have you. Are you really getting much healthier by lifting six times a week versus twice a week? Probably not. And it's worth reflecting and noticing that, oh, okay, I'm not getting healthier here. That's worth keeping in mind. But I can just keep lifting because I enjoy, I enjoy lifting. Or maybe because you enjoy getting bigger, and that's like a pursuit in its own right. It feeds your soul. Not everyone exercises for the same reasons, and that's fine. And yet again, I refuse to read the comment. I think his take is good here. Uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by enough. You know, because like enough to see some growth, agreed. Even with just five to 10 sets a week per muscle for most lifters, you will likely see some muscle growth. However, if by enough you mean maximizing your growth, that is very unlikely. Most people will see their maximum growth at closer to 10 to 20, or likely even more than 20 sets per week per muscle. And before you come for me in the comments, I have done that volume training almost always to failure. People always say, oh, it's impossible to recover from that many sets. Sounds like a you problem. Dreamer bulk, with the idea that you're going to just get huge and stay lean, like short of like an unbelievable drug cocktail, which probably kill you anyway, and or unreal genetics, it's really just nothing that pans out. Once you are fat, you got to diet all that fat off. I and mean, look, if you gain like 40 pounds in a few months and seven and a half of that, that's really good, of was muscle, you have to diet off 33 and a half pounds of fat? Sorry, 32 and a half? Good God, math. But it's just like, Holy shit, like that's 30 pounds of fat. You have to diet off. I'm sorry, but this is just bullshit. I mean, I respect Dr. Mike, but so many people keep repeating this idea that aggressive bulks are a waste of time when it's just not true. Surpluses of a thousand or more calories can be a really good way to fully maximize muscle growth and strength gains. And as long as your training is on point, you can still maintain a lean and aesthetic look in the process. You just have to make sure that you, um, uh, holy fuck, I was fat. Okay, maybe not. That is the peak male form, in case you didn't know. In clothing, absolute tank, fridge, you know? That's what I'm aiming for. Thank you for being a friend, and thank you for noticing that I, in fact, lost, like, 30 pounds of fat. I appreciate it. On a serious note, it seems like Sean does a lot of comedy, which is cool, I guess, but his points are on point, for lack of a better vocabulary. Yeah, a calorie surplus of much more than about 300 is probably not doing you any good if your aim is to make somewhat lean gains. At around like a 300 calorie surplus, I couldn't tell you for sure that, that bulking faster than that 
is going to increase your hypertrophy very much, if at all, and it's definitely increasing your fat gains. So take that as you will. I generally recommend gaining about half a percent to a percent of body weight per month, which for most people is around one to 300 calories as a surplus. So this exercise has been blowing up all over TikTok lately. This video here has over 5 million views and a bunch of people tagged me in it, assuming I'd say it's a waste of time. However, okay, yeah, it's pretty much a waste of time. I mean, it's better than a plate press because at least you can load it properly. And it's better than a hex press because it's more stable. But these super narrow grip variations are just gonna put more emphasis on the triceps and provide a weaker stimulus to the chest compared to standard pressing motions. The only reason you can feel your chest so strongly here is because you're actively squeezing inward the whole time, but you can recreate that same sensation without using any weight at all. It's not because the pecs are being loaded more effectively. So unless you're training specifically for performance in order to compete in the Smith Machine V-Bar Press Olympics, I'd probably recommend skipping this one. Short muscle lengths can get the knife, that's all I got to say. That was me reacting to Sean Nalivanich's takes. Apologies for the butchering yet again. Honestly, man, very good takes. I was expecting worse and I kind of loved it. Fuck it, eight or nine out of 10. Very solid. I really enjoyed these takes. Obviously they weren't about the deepest, most meticulous scientific findings ever. A lot of them were just average lifter wants to know this information. Can you provide this information? And he provided that information, which I respect because he's providing good information to a ton of lifters out there. Resident Pencil Next reaction is over. If you enjoyed the video, leave a comment letting me know who else you want to see me react to. Leave a like, subscribe as well. I know like 50% of you aren't right now. I'm on your ass is what I'm saying. If you want me to coach you, check out the link above and I could become your coach. And if you're like, no, I don't want you to coach me. I want robot you to coach me. You, but better. Check out myoadapt.com. It's a training app we've been working on for about two and a half, three years now. And it's been long overdue, but we've put a ton of work into it, a ton of science to essentially have a coach in your pocket, delivering you individualized training programming aimed at maximizing your hypertrophy based on your lifestyle, your preferences, what routine you'd like to follow, when you want to start. And I'm confident saying there's nothing else like it out there currently. And if you go to myadapt.com, you'll be able to sign up to be notified when it does get released. And when it does, you'll be able to lock in at a lower price than at any other time point. So go and sign up. In the meantime, have a fantastic day. Wolf Coaching HQ, still no functional sign. See you next time. Peace.